very warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24 tonight. And I thought of talking about Sri Lanka's deep crisis, how Sri Lanka is managing the way out of this crisis, and uh, uh, especially a friend that came to Sri Lanka's assistance during the deepest trouble that Sri Lanka plunged into. I've invited to our studios none other than the uh, envoy of uh, the Indian mission in Colombo. High Commissioner Gopal Bagle, a very warm welcome. Are you Bowen? And uh, a very warm welcome to you to our program. Very good morning. Are you Bowen? Namaskar, Vanakam to you, to Ada Derena, and all the viewers. Thank you for your time, but it's uh, unfortunate that you're leaving Sri Lanka, of course, after the end of your stay here. Uh, you've been here 2020 onwards. It's, uh, it's been a crucial time in Sri Lanka's history uh, in terms of managing what, uh, what was called the, an unprecedented crisis, a crisis never seen in the independent Sri Lanka. Um, before we talk about the crisis, how has your stay been? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a most memorable stay, I would say. Uh, and I, I think it's been a great opportunity for me professionally as well as personally to see india sri lanka relationship and our cooperation grow to great strength and to grow very very deep at a very crucial time and uh, indeed i would say that through these years what i have seen is that india sri lanka relationship has actually proved its mettle what we have been able to see is that the people of sri lanka and the well-being of the people of Sri Lanka has been right through this period, has been at the core, at the front and center of our policy, of India's policy to Sri Lanka. So it's been a period uh, most memorable for me, uh, an eventful period, but also very enriching and rewarding, both professionally and personally. Uh, you were the diplomat stationed here in Sri Lanka, intervening, influencing all that was happening. India came into Sri Lanka's assistance during the height of the crisis, even before Sri Lanka really looked at uh, at this crisis in a more uh, progressive manner in, to come out of this. Uh, what challenges did you have to overcome at this stage, especially uh, talking about uh, the, the diplomatic front, managing the political front, and India's stance here in managing Sri Lanka, especially when we see over the years, uh, Sri Lanka-India relations has uh, seen an up and down motion. Uh, well, uh, now I see only up and up. Mm -hmm. So I can only speak about the tenure that I have been here the last three and a half years. Uh, you asked about the challenges. Uh, in 2021, the second half of 2021, when the pandemic of COVID had left the entire world uh, in a state of various consequences, where people were trying to understand how to deal with those consequences. There were economic consequences, social and health related. It was quite clear that Sri Lanka and India will be working together after fighting the COVID pandemic as such in order to challenge, in order to address the challenges mm -hmm. of the, especially the economic challenges. So the first request that we received from the government of Sri Lanka was about the line of credit for fuel. And uh, around the same time also, the uh, currency swap, $400 million currency swap, and the deferment of clearances, which ultimately were close to $2 billion under the Asian Clearance Union, that were also then processed and another credit facility of $1 billion. So total about uh, $4 billion worth of assistance was processed very quickly. Now, I must mention to you that uh, these things take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. We were able to do in weeks and days what we normally uh, have uh, or can do in, in months and years. Uh, India has never uh, rendered this type of assistance to any country. And uh, it was the speed, it was the scale, and I would say the mo it, what we tried to do was to try and understand what are Sri Lanka's requirements. If it was milk powder, it, if it was wheat flour, if it was rice, if it was medicine, what are the requirements, and then try and come up with the, with the solution very, very quickly. So speed was of prime essence. And I must say that from government of Sri Lanka, we received great cooperation. 
and I'm very fortunate actually as a diplomat here, uh, we are very fortunate that the leadership in India is very clear and committed to a strong India-Sri Lanka relationship. That in fact is the biggest strength. Uh, the instructions to me were very clear, r right from the Prime Minister of the country, Sri Narendra Modi, to the External Affairs Minister, Dr. Jay Shankar, to the Finance Minister, Mrs. Sita Raman. Everybody was very, very clear, very clear instructions. I just needed to generate the way forward, uh, the broad direction, and what we have to do was already clear in the mind of our leadership, who, who always have the welfare and well-being of Sri Lanka's people in their heart. With India um, looking into Sri Lankan affairs at the time with, uh, with such compassion, uh, was the political instability in Sri Lanka concerning uh, to, to your leadership? Well, I, I do remember that last year when uh, the developments took place around May and May, May to July, uh, uh, I think uh, what we did was to come out absolutely unequivocally in support of democracy and stability and economic recovery of Sri Lanka. Uh, India made its position very clear right at the highest level that we will continue to support democracy and stability and the well-being of the people of Sri Lanka will remain at the center of our, our efforts in Sri Lanka. Uh, you asked about uh, also uh, whether politically what did I have to manage and were there any expectations uh, on part of India from Sri Lanka, so to say, in return. I would say that there was never such a thing. You know, uh, the Indian support and Indian assistance does never have uh, strings attached to it. Last year, there was an unprecedented situation. Uh, the response needed to be effective, efficient, with great speed, not only bilaterally, but it's also in fora like the International Monetary Fund. Uh, there was support from India for Sri Lanka's, uh, for approving Sri Lanka's program. India was the first country to give the written assurances to IMF, which were required at that time last year, before IMF could approve the program for Sri Lanka. And now, of course, as you know, India is not the member of Paris Club, but we chaired, rather co-chaired, the official creditors committee, which has now announced a successful understanding on debt restructuring. So India played the role bilaterally, as well as internationally, to support Sri Lanka. And our relationship is very deep, very civilizational. Uh, there, is, uh, there, is a, there, is, there is a bond that people of India feel towards the people of Sri Lanka. There is a great affection that the leadership of India has towards the people of uh, Sri Lanka. So our relationship is not transactional. It's a very deeply rooted civilizational relationship. Do you feel Sri Lanka is reciprocating in uh, this, this efforts and the kind of relationship that India uh, is extending to the island? Uh, well, uh, it always takes two to tango, isn't it? Um, the question of China, High Commissioner, especially with the visit of uh, Chinese vessels to uh, Sri Lanka, what is called surveillance vessels, um, China uh, clarified that these were uh, navigational or uh, missions that were uh, no harm to security of India or the region. India has been concerned, which is understood. But when it comes to Sri Lanka, what is India's expectation of Sri Lanka, especially um, in the question of China? Well, uh, let me not comment on Sri Lanka's relationship with any other country. Uh, so if I may, I will answer your question in two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, say what India's relationship with Sri Lanka is, and then I will come to, if you permit, on the specific question you asked pertaining to the security aspects. See, uh, India and Sri Lanka relationship is a unique relationship. It's a, it, it has got unique strengths. There is civilizational bond from the time of Buddha's message to so many other religions, culture, civilization, cuisines. So that civilizational bond is there. Then there is the aspiration of our people for democracy and development. We, the two countries are diverse, India and Sri Lanka. We are the oldest democracies in the modern times in, in our region. And of course, there's a great potential to develop connectivity. So I call it the ABC of India-Sri Lanka relationship. A is the aspirations that our people share for democracy and development. B is for the bond 
of civilization, the deep bonds that we have through religion, culture, hundreds, centuries, thousands of years. And C is connecting for prosperity. So this is the ABC of India-Sri Lanka relationship. We are not only geographically close neighbors, but we have history, deep-rooted history, we share heritage, and we share aspirations. So this is a unique, these are the unique strengths. So India-Sri Lanka relationship, that's why, is a symphony of music through thousands of years, and it's not a sum of uh, a few transactions here and there. Uh, so the, I, I would therefore not like to compare this relationship with any other relationship, mm -hmm. much less speak about any other relationship of Sri Lanka with any other country. Now the specific question that you asked, see, India and Sri Lanka both are Indian Ocean countries. Indian Ocean region belongs to India, Sri Lanka, and countries which are in the Indian Ocean. So Sri Lanka, as you know now, is also leading the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka had the chairmanship of BIMSTEC until last year, and uh, it, is, it is in the Bay of Bengal context. So this region, these waters that we share, these waters, the seas, the oceans around us that connect, and not only today, they have connected India and Sri Lanka for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Ensuring the freedom of navigation, ensuring peace, prosperity, and progress is a shared responsibility of India and Sri Lanka. The maritime challenges which arise, uh, the other challenges which arise in the modern times, we have to contend those challenges, face those challenges together through mutual understanding and cooperation. And that is the order of the day. That is the requirement because there can be prosperity and peace when there is security, when there is stability. So for that purpose, I am happy that India and Sri Lanka have a very good conversation. We, we have a continuous engagement. Our defense cooperation is growing. And ensuring the security of the region in which we both are situated is a shared responsibility. In that sense, I would say our security, security of India and Sri Lanka and the region is mutual and indivisible. When India is secure, Sri Lanka is secure. When Sri Lanka is secure, India is secure. Uh, to add to my question also, High Commissioner, especially with Sri Lanka's negotiations in terms of securing um, financing assurances uh, and debt restructuring, India together with other countries requested that Sri Lanka be transparent with the kind of conditions we work with China. Mm -hmm. um, is, why is this a concern and, and, and uh, how do you see Sri Lanka managing uh, the situation? Especially, does India see that Sri Lanka is either falling into trouble, or does it seem as if the, the region uh, is at threat? Uh, well, don't worry about the trouble. We are here. Huh? As one of the movie line goes, <laughs> 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 uh, but that's in the lighter mm -hmm. vein. More seriously, uh, the whole process of debt restructuring is essentially based on certain commitments and fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. These were, if I am not mistaken, these were first uh, propounded, these were first mentioned in the policy statement with which the government of Sri Lanka had come out uh, on 12th April 2022 last year. Mm -hmm. That's when the policy statement had come out about the what is popularly called the debt default. And in that it was mentioned also that uh, the debt restructuring what will be the parameters of the debt restructuring, what will be included in debt restructuring, what will not be included in debt restructuring, and the fundamental principles of debt restructuring. Now, the fund, what is the fundamental principle? If there are a few creditors, then none of them should suffer more than the other or benefit more than the other. We call it equitability or comparability of treatment. Now, how can you ensure equitability and comparability? Through transparency, that is, you know what I am discussing, and I know what you are discussing. So these two principles, equitability and transparency in the debt restructuring in Sri Lanka's discussion with all Sri Lanka's creditors is very important. It is essential. And it was a commitment given right at the very beginning, not by creditors, but by Sri Lanka. So it is up to Sri Lanka to uphold that commitment. Then in March this year, the Honorable President of Sri Lanka Honorable Ranil Vikram Singhji, he issued a public letter 
to address to all the creditors. I'm sure you would be aware of that, where he reiterated that Sri Lanka's debt restructuring will be in accordance with, with the principles of equitability and transparency. So all that is required and that, that was required was to just maintain and uphold these principles. Mm -hmm. uh, Sri Lanka's strategic location and being in such close proximity to India, uh, do you feel that, uh, do, does India still feel that Sri Lanka will be the ground uh, to, to pose a threat against India? Well, I've, uh, I cannot imagine that, frankly, because we are such civilizational uh, twins. Uh, I call it, there's a Sinhalese word, beautiful Sinhalese word, Sahodara. Sahodara means the, 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 the progeny which, which share the same womb. India and Sri Lanka has come from the same womb of civilization. Whether it is languages or religions or culture, we are Sahodara, we are brothers or sisters, if you wish. So uh, how can, they, how can uh, Sri Lanka ever imagine that India will pose a threat or India imagine that there can be a threat to India from Sri Lanka's soil? Indeed, there are repeated uh, assurances given by the highest level of leadership in Sri Lanka that no harm will come to India. Uh, and we trust those assurances. Where does India want to position itself, especially we've seen uh, India, a superpower in the region, uh, making advancements uh, that, that the whole region is proud about. Where does India want to position itself in the future? Uh, well, there are certain attributes mm -hmm. that we have in terms of uh, geography and demography. Uh, we are the most populous country in the world as of now. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the largest democracy. And India, is, as you would know and your viewers would know, is the fifth largest economy. And soon, it will be within the first three. Uh, we are nearing $4 trillion in terms of the GDP size. And uh, in 2047, when we complete 100 years, we aim to achieve $30 trillion, which means in the next 25 years, we aim to add $26 trillion, that is on an average, $1 trillion every year. Mm -hmm. There's a huge opportunity in this for all our neighbors and friendly countries. And we are indeed very open, and we would like the region to grow together because it is our fundamental belief that uh, the prosperity of the region is in the best interest of India. Mm -hmm. What is good for Sri Lanka is good for India. So as India grows, as uh, the tide of India's growth comes, it will lift other boats also. And we wish to partner with Sri Lanka, with our other friendly countries, not only in the region, elsewhere in the world, as sovereign equals. So there is nobody uh, 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 elder or younger in this relationship. We all are equal. We are all friends and partners. Indeed, I would go one step further. You would have perhaps heard this phrase, and your viewers would have also heard this phrase. Vasudhava Kutumbakam. This is an old Sanskrit uh, phrase, uh, which means that the whole world is one family. And this is one of the foundational principles of Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi's uh, foreign policy. Uh, we consider the world is family, and in that family, neighborhood is the first. So this is what we want to do, that we wish to develop uh, ourselves, and we wish to share the benefits of our growth, of our development, of technological advances, of information technology, digitalization, financial connectivity, all other types of connectivity with our neighbors, with our friendly neighbors, such as Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. That uh, is one. So may I just yes, add two more sentences to this? Of course. The other is, the, is a little more global role, mm -hmm. where there are global issues, such as climate change, or indebtedness, or terrorism, or food security. Now, you would know and your viewers would know that India was the uh, president, the, the chair of the G20. But even before we had G20 summit, we had what is called the Voice of Global South Summit in January. And one after the G20 summit. What we are doing there is we are getting the views from the developing countries, which are not represented in G20, and taking those concerns and questions of the developing countries to G20. We have put them front and center in the G20 discussions. We are very honored and very privileged that the president of Sri Lanka participated in both the summits virtually. So our effort, India's effort, is to be the voice and take the concerns and questions and uh, get them deliberated, discussed in fora like G20, and uh, come out with discussions, come out with action plans 
There are a number of action plans that we have put in place, whether it is Global Solar Alliance or International Solar Alliance or now the Alliance for Biofuels or even uh, celebrating millets as a superfood, but our civilization, Sri Lanka and India have had. So these are the things in which we want to uh, share the benefits of our experience and the economic weight that we are now gathering, the gravitas that is available to India. Let that be, why should only be for the benefit of India and Indians? Mm -hmm. This benefit should be available to all our friends. Uh, to add to that, one South Asia, how committed is India to this? You spoke about the region and how India's prosperity can trickle down to the region. But there is no other region that's so close geographically, yet so distant politically and ideologically. But as the largest and strongest uh, in these few countries who can be connected and benefit from India's prosperity and each other's development, how committed is India uh, to, to iron out these issues and bring one South Asia and South Asia to become one? Uh, if you really look at South Asia, the some things that I spoke earlier about are available to us in abundance. Mm -hmm. We have great civilizational connect. We have good connectivity, mostly through geographical borders, land borders, with Sri Lanka, of course, over waters. Uh, we have great opportunity for economic collaboration and integration. Now, you mentioned rightly that India is the largest, but also centrally placed geographically. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to do is build those connectivities with all our neighbors. If you take power grid connections, if you take oil pipelines, roads, railways, transport, more flights, more facility for people to trade and travel, promote tourism. If you see what is happening in India's relations with, let's say, countries like Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, everywhere, these are the vectors on which we are able to make progress in promoting more economic and people-to-people -people connectivity mm -hmm. using the civilizational metrics that we already have. With Sri Lanka, it is also the same effort that we are engaged in. For example, just let me give you one example, the power grid. Now, there is Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, BBIN power grid. These, the, the electrical grids of these countries can be connected, and then there can be two directional flow of electricity from one country to another. So that is the type of integration, economic integration. And in fact, uh, the people in India have also followed with great interest the statements of Honorable President of Sri Lanka when he speaks about more economic integration within our region and more economic integration between, in, between India and Sri Lanka in particular. So I'm very happy that precisely uh, we are moving precisely in the direction in which you said. And why just one South Asia? Why not the one whole world? I said the whole world is but one family. Mm -hmm. Um, you spoke about connectivity, High Commissioner. Sri Lanka is looking at uh, uh, reconnecting or establishing connectivity in, in, with India uh, by land, power, energy. Uh, with all this, how do you see the progress of uh, the, the connectivity that we're making and what challenges does Sri Lanka have to overcome here? Uh, well, connectivity has a few areas. Uh, one is, of course, the normal connectivity that you see the flights coming mm -hmm. and going, bringing tourists. And I'm very happy that Indian tourists continue to be the largest source of tourist inflow into Sri Lanka. That's very heartening for us. And Indian tourists also find Sri Lanka very beautiful. They love it. They love Sri Lanka. So, but that is only one aspect of it. What uh, for future? See, our our uh, our past has been connected. Mm -hmm. Our present, we have similar aspirations that I spoke about. And our future, uh, our destiny is also shared. So we have to promote connectivity. The main aspects here are energy and power, uh, which means power grid, connecting the power grids, uh, securing energy security for Sri Lanka, ensuring energy security for Sri Lanka, and providing a connectivity corridor for the, for the people. Uh, if you give me a minute each, I will tell you what, what is the progress there. Power grid actually, uh, I don't know if your viewers would be available, uh, uh, would be aware of this. Uh, power grid is something we have been discussing now for close to 12, 13 years. It is very simple. There are uh, there is a very uh, short distance of water and uh, some some distance over land. Uh, but if power grid can be connected, Sri Lanka's uh, grid connection can be established with India. 
then this 56 gigawatt offshore wind potential that Sri Lanka has. There is a recent World Bank report which has come out. So this 56,000 megawatt of offshore wind potential Sri Lanka has uh, from Menar to Trincomalee. That surplus can be produced, of course not tomorrow, but in a few years time and can be exported to India. Because India is growing today at 7.5%, will continue to grow like that as I mentioned earlier. So there is a ready market available to Sri Lanka. Uh, the COVID situation, it produced disastrous consequences. Why? Because the exports shrank practically to zero. Tourism was not possible. Overseas remittances stopped. But if Sri Lanka were exporting this electricity, it is perhaps a source of revenue for Sri Lanka, which is not so vulnerable to disruptions like COVID as the other three sources were. Okay. So this is a, there is a great opportunity for Sri Lanka. We have, we have all the material available with us. It is up to us to develop that. The connectivity corridor, the overland connection between India and Sri Lanka, I think that will be a very important uh, component because that will be a highway to prosperity. Imagine the, the facility it will provide to pilgrims, the Buddhist pilgrims, the Hindu pilgrims coming from India to Sri Lanka, the Buddhist pilgrims going from here to India, the tourists, the trade, and all sorts of movement can happen there which will promote economic activity in both countries and benefit the people. I would say that will be a highway to prosperity. It will be a two-way path to progress of people in both countries. We do need to uh, get into the details. We are at an exploratory stage in terms of the connectivity corridor. Uh, also establishing an oil pipeline. We have made progress. We have set up a joint study group and we are working out the feasibility study of that. Power grid interconnection, the technical discussions have advanced to a, to a very, uh, very high level. And now I think there is time to finalize the technical parameters and move on to uh, implementing it. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, Sri Lanka could have not uh, plunged into this crisis if uh, some of the commitments made earlier were fulfilled or some of the projects uh, that, that were um, abandoned were not abandoned? And also I'd like a uh, 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 question to uh, the, the, this very question. How would you advise Sri Lanka to move forward in managing relations, especially at there were times when Sri Lanka soured relations um, with foreign nations by not committing or fulfilling uh, commitments? Uh, well, uh, in my profession as a diplomat, what we have to do is to deal with what we have and then work out something which serves the purpose of both the countries in a spirit of give and take. So let me not go into the territory of what would have been. What I would be happy to do is, and have been happy to do here in my tenure, is to uh, take the relationship in a direction, uh, bring these elements which will connect the two countries, connect the two people and economies in a better way. As for uh, advice to Sri Lanka, I don't wish to go into that territory. I am the high commissioner of another country here. I am not foreign policy advisor to the government of Sri Lanka. I think uh, Sri Lankan leadership uh, is, uh, we, we trust the wisdom of the Sri Lankan leadership to decide in the best interest of the people of Sri Lanka. On that note, I think it's time we take a short commercial break here at Hyde Park on other Derana 24. We are in conversation with the High Commissioner of India in Colombo, Sri Lanka, His Excellency Gopal Bagli. Do stay with us. We'll return soon. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park and we're in conversation with the Indian diplomat in Sri Lanka. We've been talking about India-Sri Lanka relations, but I'd like uh, especially to talk about your time here in Sri okay. Lanka for a minute. Uh, you visited the north. Uh, how, how, how much did you connect with the northern part of Sri Lanka and what observations did you make recently? Uh, okay, uh, are you talking about my last visit? Yes, uh, okay. you're very recent. Very last, recent. Yes. But I've been to the north and I've been to uh, almost all parts of Sri mm -hmm. Lanka, east, center, south, west, where we live. Uh, when I visit the north, uh, I'm struck, uh, frankly, a lot by the civilizational connect. Mm -hmm. And just as when I go to Kandy and I go to the Tooth Relic Temple, or I go to Katargama, or I go to Sigiriya, or I go to Trikoneshwar in Trincomalee, 
so this civilizational connect uh, when I go to the north and visit the Tirikuteshwaram temple or the Nallur temple or see the life in general, there's a great civilization or the language, the, the people, the culture. Uh, there's a great and very deep civilizational connect just as it is in other parts of Sri Lanka also with India. So that is one. Uh, the second thing which uh, I uh, always try to work more on is we have uh, India has been working with, uh, with, the, with Sri Lanka to bring development cooperation to north in terms of housing, railway, agriculture and all these uh, different areas of which, which began after rehabilitation. But, and now more in terms of bringing more strength to the economy, uh, that is the area. So there is more potential for adding a few dimensions and expanding the development cooperation. That, that would be my second observation. Mm -hmm. The third is uh, what I spoke about, connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefits from connectivity will be immense. As you know, there are already direct flights between Chennai and Jaffna. They began with four flights per week. Mm -hmm. Now they are, you know, they, were, they went up to everyday daily flights. They've crossed 300 flights, I am told, uh, since last year. And they are greatly in demand, uh, overbooked. There is a waiting list. The ferry services started between Nagapattinam and KKS, Kanke Santorai. Uh, now we are looking for an all-weather ferry and hopefully it will start soon in future. Between Rameshwaram and Talai Manar, that what used to be the rail ferry, that also we are working very closely with the government of Sri Lanka to develop that ferry service, resume it again, uh, which will greatly help again the pilgrims and common people. So uh, developing connectivity, not merely through flights and ferries, but what I spoke about, power grid, oil pipeline, and connectivity corridor, that will benefit not just the region, the north, but entire Sri Lanka. So these are my three main observations uh, that, that I, I think I had. But if I may, on a, in a, on a lighter mm -hmm. note, when I go to the north, uh, and since you are a lady, if I may mention that I see uh, quite a number of girls and women on paddle bicycles or even two wheelers going around uh, maybe to their schools or homes or doing their work. So that's very heartening to see. Mm, true. A war ravaged um, region, um, the north, the east, how much can India really, you spoke about how you can improve connectivity, but in terms of bringing investments, bringing some of India's larger corporations to support rebuild uh, one of Sri Lanka's most lush, green, I mean, environment, region, soil, that vegetation is, is rich and where you can improve productivity. What kind of role can India play in improving the north and east that was ravaged for three decades due to war? So the first aspect is uh, developing more connectivity mm -hmm. because even if business people travel or tourists come, they need connectivity. So developing more connectivity with the north and the east will benefit the region and the country as a whole. And it will also uh, uh, help Indian people discover new destinations. There is a great, uh, we all speak of Ramayana circuit, but there is a great potential of developing Shiva circuit. So there are so many Shiva dhams in the north and the east of, uh, and in fact even Katargama is related to uh, Kartike, okay. Murugan. So uh, developing connectivity is the first. Second, identifying sectors such as agriculture and developing services sectors such as information technology, that is very important. At the same time, uh, education at multiple levels, primary as well as school level and uh, higher education also. So we have, uh, as you would have perhaps noticed, India, uh, the government of India had announced special packages for the north and the east recently and we are implementing them. They focus primarily on these areas. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the north and the south, where the, we, we've been uh, hearing about in Indian investments in Sri Lanka in more recent times, but uh, there is also, you probably have heard this, uh, the concern among uh, com some parts of Sri Lanka there were, but especially the private sector, whether uh, larger Indian corporations which uh, have a footprint in the globe or competing globally, may come to Sri Lanka with the kind of trade developments that we're talking about uh, and India's intervention, uh, whether it's peace or war, whether it's uh, development or uh, investment, will be larger and these private companies wouldn't have space to stand um, its ground here in Sri Lanka. Um, 
and the kind of professional jobs that will be wiped out because of either low priced labor or low priced products and services coming into Sri Lanka. Uh, so how do you look at this? What, what sort of uh, um, view do you have here, especially for the private sector? This is a concern among some of our larger private sector companies. I would say that this concern is completely misplaced uh, for a simple reason that the Indian investment, wherever it goes, it creates local jobs. I will give you examples. Last month, I visited the uh, assembly plant of Mahindra. Mm -hmm. I'm citing examples, but this is true of all, uh, all Indian investment here. Uh, almost all employees there are Sri Lankan. They have taken Sri Lankan youth and trained them. Take, for example, Lanka IOC. Almost all the employees in Lanka IOC, whether here or in Trincomalee or in their uh, other places, they are Sri Lankan. Very few expats. The HCL technologies, which came here during the height of COVID and has established a global software development center, in no time they went from zero to 20, uh, so, sorry, zero to 2000. Okay. Uh, more than 95% of their employees that they are training for this global software development are Sri Lankan. So this is completely misplaced. The other thing is that the, uh, the large Indian companies have been in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is no stranger to them. Tata's have been here. Taj Samudra, Taj Hotel is one of the Tata enterprises, but also is vehicles. Mahindra has been here. Ashok Leyland has been here as Lanka Ashok Leyland. Lanka IOC has been here. And now the ITC is also there. Uh, this uh, uh, this Ratnadipa Tower, which is coming up right on golf face, golf green. Golf is green. So that is. So these are one. Of the, I just took some examples because these are the f images that come to my mind. But generally, what is true of Indian investment is wherever it goes, it creates local capacities. It hires local talents. And let me tell you one more thing. And it will. It might be a new thing for your viewers. It is very difficult now uh, in India. In India, mm -hmm. for even multinational companies to pay the salaries that Indians want. Earlier on, many of our uh, fresh graduates, engineers, etc., used to go to uh, go abroad for seeking jobs. I'm not saying they're not going, but even in India, their salaries are so high that it is practically not possible for our companies to send them uh, overseas and give them those type of high salaries. It's not cost effective at all. So, a partnership between private sector, and this was the theme when our honorable finance minister came here last month. A uh, very significant uh, CII and FIKI delegation, these are the two apex chambers in India of industry, uh, they came here and they had very good delegation and this was what we discussed. Mm -hmm. How do we synergize our strengths and let me assure you there is absolutely no threat to the jobs of Sri Lankans, that is not the model India follows. And the private sector corporates who are not able to really compete with larger Indian companies. That is always in a partnership, if you really look at all these companies. Uh, the, is for the Trincomalee tank farm, for example, LIOC and CPC are partners uh, for the tanks that they will develop. Uh, I, as far as I remember, Tata and Mahindra, they both have local partners. So uh, our model is this, the private sector always uh, tries to create local capacities because they also, it's in their business interest also, that's the model as far as I understand. So this, this is complete, uh, I would say it's, it's a misconception. There is no fear to Sri Lankan jobs from Indian investment. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, the timeline of some of the investments that have been discussed during your period. Do we, do we see anything in the pipeline or uh, during, uh, uh, during the coming year or you two, except what we've been talking, especially with the Adani development, um, any other developments that we're seeing here in Sri Lanka? Uh, yeah, so there are projects which are at various stages. The, uh, what you mentioned, mm -hmm. the, one of the uh, terminals here, mm -hmm. West Container Terminal, I think it's progressing well and it should be online sometime next year. What I've been told is third quarter or fourth quarter of next year, so that, that should come up. Uh, there is also possibility of investment in renewable energy segment, both from Indian private sector and public sector, mm -hmm. and uh, health, infrastructure, logistics, shipping, education, uh, and also information technology. These are the areas where we are focused. The, apart from the larger uh, Indian names, I think the real opportunities is for the what we call the MSMEs, 
the micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because our youth in both the countries are talented. As you would know, perhaps your viewers would also know, India has now developed a fantastic ecosystem for startups. Mm -hmm. And so is Sri Lanka doing now. There is great opportunity for our youth to collaborate, for our MSMEs to collaborate. Mm -hmm. That will be the real game changer because our youth today, which is seeking jobs, will, will become job provider. Mm -hmm. uh, President Ramin Vikramasinghe, during his visit to India, uh, the, both leaders uh, of, of uh, the two countries adopted a policy document of vision for uh, India-Sri Lanka relations. Uh, there was a mention about developing the Trincomalee oil tank yes. farm. What's the process and progress of it? Uh, there was talk about making the Trincomalee oil tank farm that uh, an energy hub. Uh, what's the progress? So as you know, the uh, uh, Trincomalee tank farms have one portion, the lower tank farm, mm -hmm. which LIOC developed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the years that it has had it, and it is uh, it is functioning fully. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, your viewers would be happy to know, perhaps they already know, that the Trinko Mali terminal of Lanka IOC was the lifeline from where the fuel was supplied last year when the petrol bunks uh, uh, did not have enough fuel in the country to disperse. So Trinko Mali tank farm, the lower tank farm, is already fully functional. In fact, it has lube manufacturing, grease, grease making, the, the lubricants also, Lanka IOC is making it there. What we are talking about is the development of the storage facility in the upper tank farm, uh, part of which is to be developed as a joint venture between Lanka IOC and CPC. Now these, is, these tanks are old, they need to be refurbished and they are just the tanks. They will need connecting infrastructure to the jetty and to the jetty then again ships will need to come, so some work needs to be done over there. And the pipeline that we are talking about, the oil pipeline connectivity from India, I think that and the storage capacity, if once we develop it in, in Trinko Mali tank farms, these two components will work very well together. So as I mentioned, we have, we have begun the joint study between India and Sri Lanka for the oil pipeline. And the Trinko Mali tank farm, the studies are being carried out for the refurbishment of these tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, with EDCA in discussion negotiations again, ah, uh, yes. how, how do you see uh, this changing the trade relationship between uh, the closest neighbors, Sri Lanka and India? Well, as you know, uh, the India-Sri Lanka trade has grown. Mm -hmm. And uh, India uh, in 2022 was Sri Lanka's largest trade partner. Now, uh, but at that time also, not only India's exports grew, but despite the global difficulties after COVID, Sri Lanka's exports to India also grew in that year. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we are trying to do now is to quickly move uh, to finalize the ETCA, the Economic and Technological Cooperation Agreement. Uh, you and your viewers would know that in 2018, the last round was held. Mm -hmm. When the president visited India, there was an understanding, and I'm very happy that our chief trade negotiators and their delegations uh, met virtually first, then our delegation came to Sri Lanka. They were received very well. They were very productive discussions in end October. Now they have exchanged some more information and data, and they are scheduling further rounds of discussion uh, this month and the next month. So the idea is to move quickly to finalize uh, the text of the agreement and conclude the chapters, which had then remained. And wherever some modification needs to be made in the text, that, of course, the negotiators will do. That's the job. But the direction from the political level is very, very clear that as the two closest neighbor, which have great opportunities for expanding our trade and expanding the trade basket, we should move in that direction very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, with India mentioning some time during the crisis and continue to reiterate that India will be uh, continuing to be supportive of Sri Lanka's democracy, um, stability and economic recovery, I want to talk about uh, uh, Sri Lanka's path to accountability and democracy, uh, how do you see Sri Lanka's process? What is India's view of Sri Lanka's progress to accountability? Uh, in which sense? Uh, we've been talking about the UNHRC ah, okay. and Sri Lanka's accountability to um, war crimes, uh, allegations and concerns, and Sri Lanka's accountability to the international community. What is India's view here? Well, I would say that the, our position on the matter has been very consistent. Uh, both bilaterally and in multilateral fora, uh, such as in Geneva, we have spoken in a clear voice uh, consistently. Uh, we have, uh, of course, India has uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, its view about implementation, full implementation of the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. Because our own experience is that uh, individual strength 
adds to the strength of the country. Uh, development is sustainable when development is inclusive. So uh, th that is the spirit in which we approach this matter. And uh, I don't really see if there is any deviation in our policy from what it has, what it has been mm -hmm. through the years. Uh, the, the kind of developments on the Sri Lankan side with land rights to the estate community mm -hmm. uh, assured through the 2024 budget document and some other developments made. Uh, how does India see this progress and, and a political solution to the national question? Uh, you mentioned the 13th Amendment here. Um, but I, I'd seek your uh, views on this. Well, uh, these are two different questions mm -hmm. which, you, which, you, which you mentioned. So, uh, I mean, on 13th Amendment, frankly, I don't have anything else to add. What I have said, it is essentially, it has to be a negotiated uh, devolution, negotiated devolution between mm -hmm. the government of Sri Lanka and the stakeholders. As a friend and neighbor, we are always available for advice when we are asked upon, mm -hmm. when we are, when our advice is asked, when we are called upon to do that, we do that. Uh, in terms of the land rights, I think uh, I, it would be fair to say that the Indian origin Tamil community, the estate workers, are uh, among, those, among those which require developmental support the most. And this is why we have undertaken a special housing project uh, since 2017 in those areas. And uh, I'm happy that that, pro that project has progressed. Now 10,000 more houses we are going to construct. And how to give them the ownership I think there is a process which has been mm -hmm. underway over here. There is also a historical context of it, mm -hmm. as you know, the agreements in the 1960s uh, uh, th that were there. So uh, th there is a, we have to, from as far as India is concerned, we look upon this matter as something on which progress has to be here in Sri Lanka. Again, as a neighbor, as a country, which has this civilizational connect, which has this connect at the level of the people, because these people, like many other Sri Lankans, they also have families in India. There are marriages, there are movements for education, for jobs. So these are, uh, these are all the people of Sri Lanka in general, not only any one particular community. They are very well connected. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an organic connectivity. It's an organic living relationship at multiple levels. So obviously, uh, their well-being, we think, will add to the well-being and development of Sri Lanka, and therefore the development and well-being of uh, one of the closest friends that India has. Mm -hmm. in the what region. was your first impression, High Commissioner, when you uh, set foot in Sri Lanka as a diplomat to take um, over as uh, the head of the <laughs> Colombo? <laughs> you know, I, I came at the height of COVID. Mm. And uh, I don't know if you are aware, but in your profession, I'm sure you are, but some of your viewers may not be. Uh, but I came in a transport aircraft because the normal civil aviation links were not working. Mm. And uh, I came with a medical consignment. <laughs> so I was the only passenger in a cargo plane. <laughs> so when I set foot, you asked me about setting foot, yeah. I was quite relieved to come out of the cargo plane. <laughs> uh, but uh, I was very happy because to represent India in, a, in any country abroad is a, great, uh, mm -hmm. is a great fortune. And to do so in Sri Lanka is a, is a matter of great privilege. And to be the High Commissioner here is, is a tremendous honor, is a great honor. I was very happy uh, and I looked forward at that time to my, um, my assignment here. And I'm very, very happy that, uh, that the expectations I had uh, uh, of myself, uh, uh, in a sense, rising to meet the, the, the challenge, mm -hmm. the, the great responsibility given uh, to me. We're glad that uh, a senior uh, career diplomat as yourself uh, um, with decades of experience in diplomacy and uh, foreign policy, was in Sri Lanka during some of the trying times of uh, Sri Lankan history. Uh, where have you traveled in Sri Lanka during this time? Uh, you are very right. In the initial one or one and a half years, it was difficult to travel mm -hmm. because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, in fact, uh, my, the credentials that I and a couple of my other diplomatic colleagues mm -hmm. presented were not in person. They were virtual. They were done over television because of the COVID restrictions. So in the initial part, of course, there were some, some of these restrictions were there. But later on, I've traveled to every province, literally all the, trend, all the, all the districts in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a few questions that my team would like to ask oh, you, okay. especially uh, with Sri Lanka and India being avid fans of cricket. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you didn't ask that. <laughs> but, but before that, um, wh what's your favorite travel destination in Sri Lanka? My favorite travel, there are many. Uh, and uh, uh, if I may just say that uh, uh, two of them stand out. Mm -hmm. 
one is uh, the world's end when you track and you go and and see that uh, in, in the Hatton uh, Hatton Park area and the other you might be surprised is the view of sunset from my office oh, wow. <laughs> okay. you've got a premium location I believe <laughs> um, uh, your favorite Sri Lankan dish uh, I'm a vegetarian so uh, unfortunately I cannot eat the famous Sri Lankan fish curry or the seafood but I do relish kiribat mm -hmm. and cashew curry and the dessert uh, yes, of course, Kitul jag uh, with, with the jaggery. No, Kitul, yeah. jaggery. Kitul jaggery is my favorite. So curd and jaggery is, is, yeah. is, is, is very nutritious. And you would be surprised, perhaps, in India, uh, having curd with sugar or jaggery is a standard dessert for common families after meals. Mm -hmm. We grew up watching uh, Bollywood movies, learning Hindi. Uh, were you able to or did you have a chance to watch a Sri Lankan made movie? Yes, I did and uh, well uh, quite a few and uh, one of the ministers, the, cab the cabinet minister mm -hmm. honorable Bandulaji, Dr. Bandula mm -hmm. Gunavardhana is, a, is, a, is an avid uh, filmmaker yes. and, uh, and his r recent film newspaper and there were others also and we were, we were very privileged to watch it, watch some of them in his company. Sachin Tendulkar or uh, Sanat Surya? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Won't that be a devastating mm -hmm. left-right opening combination? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's the better hit, Menaravin the Silva or Rohit Sharma? Uh, well, hit comes in the name of Rohit, uh, and uh, both have a calmness when they start hitting. They don't murder; they just kill. <laughs> <laughs> Murali or Anil Kumble? 800 is Murli, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. But Anil Kumli is Indian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they are two different rulers. Yes, certainly. One is an office spinner, the other is a leggy. Mm -hmm. I think I have an idea about what you'd say. Beaches or wildlife? Uh, here I will choose. Beaches. Beaches. In Sri Lanka, again, picturesque mountains or Ayurveda and wellness? Picturesque mountain because Ayurveda and wellness is again something which India and Sri Lanka share. Mm -hmm. So uh, if I uh, wish to go to Kerala, I will find Ayurveda and wellness there also. But the mountains which are in Sri Lanka are in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Train journey to Ella or Jaffna? Uh, interesting. Train journey to Ella for the scenic beauty. Mm -hmm. Train journey from uh, Colombo to Jaffna, particularly the segment where the, tra where the track is restored. It's very smooth. I, I recommend you try it north of Andhradapura and the rest of the track is being restored under an Indian assistance by Aircon. Mm. It's very, very smooth. Okay. And uh, who is your favorite cricketing legend? Name a few in Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri in, Lankan. In Sri Lankan, uh, cricketing legends, there are many. Mm. Of course, they are more contemporary, we all know. But uh, there are few that are of the old era, like Roy Dyes. Mm and uh, Asanka Guru Singhe. Certainly, yeah. Yeah. So those are the, those are the people who, uh, who were there when Sri Lanka was not a test playing nation. And I remember also uh, reading about uh, the role of uh, several people who supported Sri Lanka uh, and Sri Lankan cricket at that time. And among them, there were a lot of Indians also. So I think some of the legends uh, like Roy and uh, Asanka, uh, I followed their cricket for a while. Pol Roti or Dosa? Pol Roti. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 hoppers or Koto? Uh, hoppers, but named Appam. <laughs> Appam. <laughs> um, the, the, your favorite wicket keeper, Dhoni or Sangha? No doubt, Sangha. Uh, I'll tell you why. I saw Sangha uh, bat for the first time in early 2000s mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in England. Mm -hmm. I was working in our high commission and Sangha was a young batsman at that time. And I remember saying this, and I never said this in public, but I, I'll say it for the first time here. I said at that time to one of my colleagues in the High Commission of India in London, this young man has more than 10,000 runs in his bat. Mm. I don't claim to be a cricket expert, but just the fluidity of his strokes was amazing. Who do you think is the best uh, match finisher, Arjuna Ranathunga or uh, Dhoni? Dhoni. Mm. Um, and your better vacation, Goa or Norelia? Uh, for beaches, of course, uh, Goa, but there are uh, even very good beaches in Andaman and Nicobar, for example, and other places in, in India, in Sri Lanka. Uh, for mountains, Norelia. Mm -hmm. 
Thank no you doubt for your it. insights there. But tourism, Sri Lanka, you mentioned about Indian tourists. We, uh, we have to mention this. We see month after month, we see a large number of Indian tourists visiting Sri Lanka. What is really uh, the, the catching point here in Sri Lanka for the, the Indian tourist? They feel at home. The Sri Lankan people are very hospitable. Mm. It's a beautiful country. The people are warm. Uh, there is similarity of culture and cuisine. See, Indian tourists like to go to place where they feel comfortable. So that, that I think helps them and uh, that explains why they come to uh, Sri Lanka and I'm very happy. Once we start the digital transactions, then I think it will be even, uh, we hope that there will be a larger number of Indian tourists coming over here. So my uh, final thought, if I may share mm -hmm. with you, is uh, for our two countries, India and Sri Lanka, which are great civilizational twins, I think our future is to grow together. Uh, uh, India is growing as an economy at, at an unprecedented scale. There is opportunity for all our friendly countries, not only Sri Lanka, but others also in the region. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my thought on that is that if we can uh, connect, cooperate, and partner, we will prosper together. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, for your time here in Sri Lanka and all the very best in your next posting. Um, in Australia, that is, if I'm not <laughs> mistaken. All the very best and uh, thank you for all your support and cooperation at uh, a very difficult time in Sri Lanka's history, as I mentioned before. It has been an honor and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you and to talk to your viewers. Uh, may I say, Bhavatu Sabha Mangalam, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina. Thank you very much. Uh, we had with us uh, in conversation tonight at Hyde Park the High Commissioner of uh, India, Gopal Bagle. Um, His Excellency Gopal Bagle has been in Sri Lanka since year 2020 until, uh, uh, until he leaves for Australia uh, next month, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we will continue to bring to you the kind of updates from India in terms of developments in India-Sri Lanka relations. We'll see you again next week at the same time on yet another discussion at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.